Hi guys, and welcome to episode two, the analysis days for season two of Stockport County Rebuilding. I don't know why I said all that backwards. Um, I'm still a bit giddy uh, from the match that we've literally just played. I've just managed to change out my suit jacket because uh, that was getting a little bit toit on me. Um, God, I, I'm, I'm still a little out of breath. And un unfortunately, my voice usually goes during these recordings. My problem is that my voice is already on the ropes after yelling uh, when Paris Magoma scored that second goal. Uh, I haven't watched any of the footage back from that yet. So hopefully it wasn't too irritating, but it was just unbridled joy, uh, basically. Um, it's certainly given us an, an entertaining end to the season, if nothing else. And I think we can all be thankful for that. But now it's time to dig into the stats. So we're going to dig in straight away. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to keep taking sips of my drink because otherwise my voice will start to sound um, like some kind of phone sex line uh, by the end. So, you know, saucy boy and all that jazz. So um, not that I know what that sounds like, obviously, because I am a normal adult. Right. So 57% um, possession. Pretty damn good, really. Um, we dominated a lot of teams in this league. Dulwich obviously kept the most because Dulwich just played some beautiful football. And I do feel for them about not going up, but just got to be better lads you know i would have liked to have played them in the final over harrogate because i was so scared of harrogate to be honest they also have one of the lowest possessions of the good sides which shows that you don't actually need possession to be successful although that being said they, they didn't go up did they so you know who's successful now we oh god dulwich had 12 penalties and scored all of them this season that's a lot of points they've gained purely from the spot we only had six but we have scored all of them um and barrow only had the one pen this year that's a shame for them they're not getting in there very much headers one we're not too far. I'm more interested in the ratios. Wow, we are very low on headers one, uh, which does concern me a little bit, but it might be because... Actually, I'm not really sure why. That That's an area where I definitely think we need to look at. Um, getting a bit more... Which is weird because of how good we are in the air for a lot of things. Uh, but I think our centre-backs might not have been winning as much this year, and particularly in the midfield. Not the tallest player. Someone having like Milan Butterfield like we did last season might have made a little bit of a difference. Dulwich got 109 yellow cards. They are a dirty bunch. Really, they really, really are. That being said, we got 81 for 48 matches. And Harrogate played, of course, they played 49 games this year. That is outrageous. Um, the least, Sutton and Macclesfield. Very clean boys. But uh, Salford, you see, if they'd have been a bit more dirty, they might have got promoted. Hey, red cards. Um, eight for Fylde. Uh, we got four. Pretty certain all of them were Enes Mahmutovic, so he's basically in a category of his own there. Uh, filed. That's that's not good for them, right? We skip the form because no one cares about the form. Harrogate, look at that. 111 goals scored by Harrogate this season. That is astonishing. 102 for Barnet, 99 for us. We were one goal away from 100. Why couldn't we put one of those chances away? Um, cross completion ratio, 23%. That is very nice reading uh, and that suggests to me that we're definitely doing something right in those areas i want to see who that's responsible or who's responsible for it but that definitely fills me with confidence 23 is very high cross is completed 464 well above anybody else harrogate of course we're going to be on there too goals from corners harrogate town 24 goals from corners we got 22 in the end which is not bad but i think at one point we had 16 from our first 29 games, and it looks like from our next 19, we've only got six, which is a bit of a shame, a bit of a fall off to the end of the season, which is weird, because that's kind of like what happened last year. Despite me not changing the tactics, we started really well from set pieces and just slowly faded away. But still, that's not too bad, is it? Harrogate 24. I'm amazed that we didn't concede one of them in the final, to be honest. Anyone really struggling? Yeah, a few teams down on like seven. Uh, so the average is somewhere around about here anyway. So we're definitely well above average, which is fine. Goals and direct free kicks four of those um i guess with someone like paris magoma in the team you're gonna get that dulwich again up there too sutton with seven though uh indirect free kick goals barnet with 10 we're only down on five so that's an area we definitely do need to work on still i've not really found a, a routine that works fully for me on uh, direct free kicks just yet but we'll certainly get there uh pass completion dulwich again their possession and pass completion truly one of the best sides in the league in terms of beautiful football as we saw when we played them but we're not doing too bad on that one 70 percent ourselves I'd like to think that we'll get more space as we move up the leagues in places, and we might actually be able to play a bit more uh, nice football. But at the moment, I'm very happy with what we're doing because I still get comments from people being like, oh, you need to drop the, the line deep because then you'll stop conceding goals. That's not how it works. You drop a deeper line, you're just not going to concede those goals. Like, there isn't a, a, a foolproof strategy. The fact is, we've had one of the best defences in the league for two years in a row, and sometimes you just have to accept you're going to concede a goal like that. But it has so many more benefits by pushing the team up like that. It allows us to squeeze the play and win the ball up much higher up the pitch and get lots of chances by pouncing on mistakes. You, you don't need to play a low line at this level. Case in point, 
back-to-back -back promotions with not doing it. Obviously, we're not playing a very high line, but we're still playing a high line, you know? Um, I've got a real bee in my bonnet about that. You can do whatever style you want as long as you get the right players and the right strategy around it, you know? Obviously, you know, within reason. Um, chances created. Harrogate. I mean, that's actually interesting. Created the most chances this season, which would explain how they had 111 goals, to be fair. Uh, Barnet created more than us. Harrogate Town, I still feel like they're a bit unlucky. Most set-piece goals, most goals, most chances created. They did a lot right. Really? They just couldn't beat us on the day when it mattered. Shots on target ratio were right up there with 49%. Harrogate in there as well. Shots on target, 392. So this is the thing. We had 60 more shots than Harrogate, and yet they managed to score like 12 goals more than us this year. So they were being clinical with their chances. Um, they really are a very good team. Yeah, conversion rate doesn't really surprise me that they're up there on 16%. Ours is down on 12. If we'd have got it anywhere near that, um, up towards even 13 or 14%, we'd have been champions of this division. No doubt in my mind. Dagenham and Redbridge, and oh my god, look at that. They've stayed up despite only converting 8% of their chances, which suggests to me that they must have created a buttload of chances. Gateshead down there too, no surprises there. Dulwich winning a lot of fouls, us not winning that many. Dribbles per game, six as well. Look at that, they just play such great football. Harrogate, yeah, I figured they'd be kind of low. Um, Jesus, the fact that they, you know, just lump it, but that's fine. Best defence in the league, 43 goals for Barnet, 46 for us. Yes, this is the thing, Harrogate conceded 77 goals. That is an awful lot of goals for a team challenging to be promoted. In fact, I'd be very interested to know what the most goals a team's ever conceded and still gone up with. I mean, they, they conceded 31 goals more than us this season. And I think defensively, that was their main problem. Like, if you look at the games against them, we scored in every game. And we put two past them in their own grabs. We put four past them in the playoff final as well. They, they definitely weren't the best defensively. Did someone concede over 100? No. Halifax got to 99 conceded. But Harrogate, that was their main issue. Defensively, they were just woeful. Conceded from corners. We actually conceded seven to Oh my god. We conceded seven from corners, which isn't bad. That shows that we're doing a decent job at defending from corners. Harrogate, not so much, but my god. Dover conceded 21 goals from corners this year. Fire whoever is in charge of that particular situation. Um, goals and directing free... Oh dear, we were quite low on that, actually. Um, I do remember a lot of those being in live comms. I think we conceded those back-to-back -back at one point. that was filed, and there was another game where we conceded goals from corners. Solihull, I think it must have been. Um, but there you go. Conceded from direct free kick. Yeah, we were not great on this one either. Defending free kicks. I haven't actually got a default strategy for that. And that might be why that's kind of the problem. Clean sheets. 23. W Amazingly, Harrogate actually had more clean sheets than us. That's really strange. Uh, they had 12 clean sheets this year compared to our 11. But they considered 31 more goals than us. Uh, not 31. No, not what we're talking about. Like 25. Still a lot. I don't know why I keep looking up at the camera. It's not even on that. Uh, fouls made. 712. Um, yeah, we were quite a dirty team at places. Macclesfield apparently were just too nice for their own good. And that's why they came bottom of the league in the end. Jesus. In fact, isn't that back-to-back -back relegations for Macclesfield? Weren't they in League 2 last season? Uh, that's not great, is it? Jesus. Um, they're going to need a youth squad legends. They are. Um, uh, if only someone was doing that already. Now, tackles won. Um... We're quite low on i guess when you keep a lot of the ball you, ha you generally win more less tackles i imagine our tackles one ratio is look at that 97 percent tackles one these seem to have changed i feel like they're using a different metric to decide tackles one this year but 97 percent is phenomenal no wonder our defense was so good where are harrogate 94 still not bad no one's really that bad to be honest penalties conceded Blythe, 11 penalties conceded. Us, only three. Harrogate, again, not great in that one either. Average attendance, 5,900 for Notts County. Ours was 5,500. I wonder what we're going to get in League 2 next year. Uh, wow, average attendance for Gateshead was under 1,000. Average attendance by capacity, 76%. Dulwich getting some good stadiums there. Uh, Gateshead, wow, they've got a big stadium and they can he fill it to save their lives. Um... Wow, only one sellout, and I assume that was probably the Dulwich home playoff match that they might have had. I don't know, actually. It makes sense that they would have done. 12,500 in the ground for a Notts County game, and we had 10,300 for our home match against Notts County. So there was that. We made a lot of money out of that game, I can only imagine. Anyone got the high... Wow, Gates said even their highest attendance was only 1,500, and their lowest was 500. It got our lowest attendance was Actually, weirdly, um, Wrexham and Orient were more consistent with those. Uh, net transfer spend. Obviously, ours is going to be, in fact, I think we're the only player team that actually spent any money. And that is all just on Alec Moody Moo. No one else actually spent any money. Uh, we're the only ones with secure finances down here. Everyone else is either insecure or okay, I think. Yep. Right. Now, what we're really interested in, salary per annum. 21st. We only spent £600,000 this season on wages per year. 
Whereas you look at Orient, 2.7 million, didn't get promoted. Notts County, 2.5 million, didn't get promoted. Salford, 2.1 million, didn't get promoted. Barnet were the fifth most, and they got promoted with us. Harrogate would have also been uh, not, su I mean, not super impressive still. Um, it's more interesting to see that Dulwich were in the playoffs. They got the Their wage spending is three times less than ours even is. Um, literally more than 10 times less and they finished above most of those sides. So fair play to the semi-pro boys of Dulwich and Stockport County this year, showing the big boys how it's done. But I intend to keep that wage budget as low as physically possible um, as we move up the leagues. I, I think we'll definitely have the lowest wage budget in the entire division next year by country miles. And I intend to keep it that way unless we see, because I want to have the money available in case we see a fantastic signing that we really, really want. And it will mean that we don't get like silly runaway wages just in case something goes wrong financially at the club. There's all kinds of problems that could come down the line when you're going up the leagues like this. So I need to make sure that we're very, very careful with that. Right, player stats. That's what we're interested in a little bit more. So appearances, of course, um, Belshaw and Hinchcliffe played every game for their club. Hinchcliffe is probably going to be one of his final appearances for us in the playoff final because I feel like next year, Moulton probably will be our first choice keeper. But Hinchy, I mean, he's been an absolute hero. The amount of penalty saves and wonder saves he's made for this club. He's certainly going to be remembered as one of the heroes of the early part of this save anyway. Games one, uh, Barnet, I assume, is right up there, although... Hinchcliffe not doing too bad there too. Games lost, yeah, it's going to be loads of Macclesfield and Gateshead players, I would imagine. Josh Falkingham, formerly of Wimbledon during our save there, I think. Kebby got a lot of yellow cards, as did De Mayo. Kebby got a lot of yellow cards. Uh, I imagine Mahmoudovic is on here too. Amazingly, John O'Sullivan actually got four red cards this year for Wrexham. How is he still employed? He, he nearly has as many red cards as he does yellows. That's really saying something. Charlie Adams here hasn't got a single yellow, but he's got two reds. So there's that. Player of the match, Perry Hap, who's on loan, I think, uh, from... God, who's he on loan? From, along from Millwall. So, yeah, he's probably quite good when you look at things. Darren Stevenson got five. Magoma five. Duxbury five. And four for Alec Moody Moody, despite not starting that many games. Uh, what a year he's had as well. Like, really good. For a backup player that hasn't started every game, he has played phenomenally when he has played. Distance covered, Teddy Howe, great name. Scotty D up on there, not a huge surprise there. Uh, and per game, vastly, well, not vastly, but definitely in front of everyone else. And Magoma has uh, certainly put himself about a bit, quite a lot. But Scotty Duxbury, where are we going to find someone else like Scotty Duxbury? I can't imagine him being, I mean, I say I can't imagine him playing in League Two for X next season. Do you remember in the Wimbledon save where we had a guy, I can't remember who it was, a really sort of quite a bad, like a, a one and a half star player who was doing a job for us in the championship uh, at right back, I think it was. Um, quite an old player too, but he just fit the system so well. And sometimes that's just what you have to do. Top average rating in the entire division is Ashley Palmer with a 7.44. Um, maybe he'll even win player of the year. And what a way to finish the season that would be for Ashley Palmer. Great year. Scored a few home goals. Sure, but pretty damn good. Um, Paris Magoma and Duxbury up there too. Jack Payne in there. Dazza, of course, in there. How would we not have him in there? Um, Ashley Palmer's won a decent number of headers, which is fine. Top goal scorer, Rendell. No surprises. Stevenson and Thompson Brissy got 17 each. So JTB, considering I was a bit unsure of him at times, has turned up for us in the end with 17 goals in the league. And Darren Stevenson, what a man. I, I cannot believe how well Stevenson has played this year. Considering I thought he wasn't going to be cut out for this level, he's turned out and been our joint top scorer in the league for the second season in a row. I, mean, I can't really fault that. Goals per minute's played as well. Stevenson jumps up even more uh, because he... Um, well, no, that's not really what that means, is it? <laughs> in terms of games and appearances, I suppose he's probably up there. Shots, Hap, miles to the good. But Magoma's going to be up there because he takes so many damn free kicks. Shots on target. Uh, Stevenson, again, higher than JTB. So, you know, not too bad. Shots on target percentage. Phyllis Kirk, 78% shots on target is truly amazing. He did score a header against us, I think. Jake Cope, 64% shots on target, despite having one finishing. That is amazing. That he, I mean, has he not taken many shots? It feels like he would have taken enough shots, you know? He's got five goals this year, including in the playoff final. Conversion rate. Uh, nobody really on there. Jaden Anthony up there with 21% conversion rate. Will Keane doing a great job. Scott Rendell, uh, though he's 33 years old. I was just thinking, oh, maybe we could sign. No, he's, he's too old for that. Team goals. Well, we, we already know what's going to happen there. Lewis McGugan scored nine penalties this year, uh, which is astonishing. Jaden Anthony with five penalties. He's got a lot of his goals from the spot. Assists. We should have someone on there. Anthony got 13 assists this year, as well as... Uh, actually, just quickly take a look at Jen Anthony's season. 12 goals in the league, 13 assists, two Man of the Match awards. What a year he's had. Honestly, his rating of being only a 7.01 .1 is truly amazing to me that he's as low as that, um, in all honesty. Like, his finishing is so much better than Jake Cope. It's unreal. Anyway, moving back. Key passes. Paris Magoma and Jack Payne. 91 for Magoma and 78 for Jack Payne. 
it's kind of what you'd imagine. I think Moody Moo, had he played more, would probably be on there too. Chances created. Ashley Palmer's created 16 chances this year. Uh, mostly headers from corners, if I had to guess. Pass completion. Moody Moo might be available on here. No, I don't know if he's played enough passes. I know he has good pass completion. It's like 83%, but I guess he's not played enough passes in total. Kind of interesting there. Uh, cross completion ratio. Jack Payne. Yeah, okay. That doesn't really count though. Um, I guess that's because often he's out on the sidelines when he's taking throw-ins. Kebby at 24 though, and Duxbury at 23. Those are the stats I'm interested in. Uh, dribbles per game. Anyone under here at all? Anthony at 1.2. Not too bad. Could be a bit higher. Um, defensively, uh, that's actually kind of interesting. So Stevenson being in the team, we've actually only considered 33 goals with him in the team. John is... Hmm, oh, I'm more interested in goals per game. Mistakes leading to goals. Uh, nobody on there. That's what I like to see. Mistakes in total. We're going to have a few. Scotty Duxbury, because he's so far forward, unfortunately, he does get caught out from time to time. And that's fine. You've got to expect that. Uh, Dulwich Hamlet have the most key tackles, interesting, with Ashley Smith. Surprising. Key headers. Uh, Ash Palmer, of course, on 82. Interceptions. See, I want to see more players be on the interceptions because I think when we're playing a high line like that, it's key to intercept the passes a few more times. So I'm going to have to have a look at those stats. Headers one. Uh, no one on here at all. That bothers me a bit. We really are going to have to find someone better headers of the ball, really, uh, in all honesty. But I think it's because they're playing a high line. The ball's often going behind, so they're not getting the chance to win the headers, perhaps. I don't really know. Uh, goalkeeping, Ben Hinchcliffe conceded 43 goals this year. Um, obviously, Bramley conceded less, but I think he's also played a lot less games. Yeah, clean sheets as well. Henrik Ravis for Barnet, 22 clean sheets. I mean, Hinchcliffe got 11, which isn't actually as good as I thought it was. We do tend to have a habit of just conceding the occasional goal just from a ball lumped over the top, but that might happen less and less as we go up the leagues because teams tend to play a slightly different style of football. Uh, Kamal Miazek was the bane of my life at one point. Uh, so there we go. That'll do it for this sort of little roundup here. Now we're going to get into the actual squads, but I found a new way, thanks to a patron of mine, uh, Look for Overlap, who, well, not discovered, told me that if I put players in the squad, uh, in the actual, like, first 11, I can filter it by first 11, so we can get rid of any players that we don't want to show. Um, so it'll make it a little bit easier to look at this stuff, and I'm very much looking forward to that. So let's jump into this now. I might actually have to do some editing. Good lord! Also, in case anyone's wondering, there's going to be a link in the description to this video to a media file download. I was going to put this on the Steam Workshop, but there's so many of them, it makes more sense to just bundle them together. So you can download all of my analysis views that I use uh, in these videos. So you can sort of have a crack at this yourself. Obviously, add stuff that you want to put in them too. Um, I've just done it what I think works best for me. On last year's game, I used to have more of the stats available. Obviously, this isn't one of those. Uh, but I find that you can just kind of look at that stuff if you really need to make the comparison. There's more room on the screen then, and it doesn't go off the screen. So let's adjust this a bit. Now, to be perfectly honest, when it comes to goalkeepers, it really doesn't matter a huge deal because we have no one to compare this to. We, we might as well just skip this. Like, Hinchcliffe, 56 appearances in total this year. Uh, conceded how many goals? I mean, we actually don't know that. But less than one per game. 5,000 minutes played. 15 clean sheets. We've got no real comparison. That's something we'll probably have to work on in later seasons, shall we say. Okay, so it's a bit of a roundabout way of doing it, but basically you can put players that you don't want to see in the match squad. I wish it was the other way around so you could filter it so hide players that aren't in match squad. Like, why would I want to hire players that are in match squad? I, I, or at least let me do both. But but there we go. So these are the players that we want to really be looking at in terms of fullback analysis for now. Um, they obviously have slightly different jobs. So we can compare, mostly be comparing Torre to Duxbury and Kebby to Bridges. But I'm, I'm very, very interested in this. They've played a reasonable amount of minutes to the point where we can sort of take into account what's actually gone on here. But you can, you can really see. So like assists per 90 minutes. Duxbury's up there. Um, Bruno Bridges got no assists this year at all. Kebby vastly lower. But Ibu Torre, when you compare him to Scott Duxbury, it's you know it's literally half the number of assists per minute. Um, so Duxbury is definitely more adv advantageous. I think Torre's one was for a Jaden Anthony goal uh, in a game that sort of wrapped things up for us. Chances created per ninety minutes. Again, Scotty Duxbury up there. Torre in behind. Um, but you can definitely see that Toure is not as good as Duxbury in the same way that Bridges is not as good as Elliot Kebby. Um, the right-hand side isn't quite as um, important for creating chances as that left-hand side is, evidently. Um, but there's definitely a drop-off. Toure definitely does a better job at sticking close to Duxbury than Bridges does at closing in on Elliot Kebby. There's definitely a bigger drop-off there in terms of actual stats. Pass completion, it's kind of a similar story. Duxbury and Kebby, the king's there, but Toure not too far behind either of them, but Bridges falling well off the pace. Does Bridges have good passing, or is this kind of a, a bit of a black hole in his game? His passing is only six, and his vision's seven. It's not too bad, though, is it? What's, what's uh, Kebby's passing and vision? Passing of 10 and vision of 7. So Kebby definitely has much better passing and it's definitely showing there. Bridges is going to have to work on that 
because we do rely on um, getting those fullbacks to knock the ball into the center of the park a lot. So you can definitely see that Bridges is falling off the pace there and is certainly not showing any signs of being able to overtake Elliot Kebby for a first team spot anytime soon. Although you can see here that he's two and a half stars, sometimes three, depending on who you ask uh, in this team. So he's got the potential to overtake Kebby, but he definitely has a lot more work to do just yet. Maybe even a loan spell next year. Uh, get him a loan spell, maybe for a National League side or even a Conference South or North side uh, and bring in some other player to back up Kebby next season just so that Bridges gets some football and maybe he can improve and show us what he's made of out on loan. That, just a theory. Let me know what you think about getting him out on loan. Passes completed per 90 minutes. Um, again, Toure actually slightly higher than both of those two, which is kind of interesting, but th that one doesn't tell me too much. Key passes per 90 minutes does though. Uh, and this is a real key stat for me. So Bruno Bridges does make more key passes. I think we found this last season as well. So Duxbury makes more key passes than Ibu Toure. We kind of figured that. But Bridges makes quite a bit, you know, 0.11 more key passes than Elliot Kebby. And I think we did find this last year in that Kebby, better at completing passes. Uh, he creates more assists. But for some reason, Bruno Bridges is better at creating key passes per 90 minutes. Now, maybe that's because of the amount of times he's played, but I, I don't know what it is. He does seem to have an eye for a really good pass, despite not completing as many. Um, it's weird that his chances created is so low because, you know, a key pass is a pass that leads to a shot. So it seems that the chances he's creating for people, they're not putting in the back of the net. Um, or he's putting them into a position where they're taking a long shot, which is not counting as a chance, so to speak. That's the only thing I can think of as to why that's so high. So he's often playing the ball into the middle to someone like Magoma or Payne, maybe, rather than taking on his man and whipping across him for a header. That might, in my mind, explain why his is slightly higher. Dribbles per game. Scott Duxbury definitely higher. Kebby and Bridges are fairly closely matched on this one, um, but Duxbury's definitely the better player in that sense as well. So winning every stat like I expected him to. And, and this is where it really pays off. Kebby 23, Duxbury 22. The other two down on 10. Like we have so much less quality in those positions because they're not getting far forward enough. They're not completing enough crosses. I assume they both have worse crossing than the other two. Crossing of 10 on Bridges and 11 on Toure. Kebby's crossing is only nine and Duxbury's crossing is only nine and yet they're completing way more of their crosses when they get into those positions that's an interesting one answers on a postcard team conceded so we can see more goals as well with Bruno Bridges and Ebru, uh, Ebru Torre in the team they're they're just not doing as good a defensive job either uh, as is evidence Scott Duxbury really we, we're very very good with him and Kebby in the team they're definitely the first choices no mistakes leading to goals which is nice tackles one uh, all within a, a relatively close margin. Nothing major there. Interceptions per 90 minutes. This is kind of interesting. So Duxbury again up there. But Bruno Bridges doing a good job defensively there. So he's definitely cutting passes out a little bit more. Toure is massively underperforming in that area. And it shows. That goal we considered against Harrogate. I feel like he could have intercepted that. And it really has cost us. Headers 1 ratio. Bruno Bridges at 76%. So he's definitely doing the defensive side of the game quite nicely too. Um, whereas Ibru Torre just can't defend to save his life. Is he quite tall or is he a short boy? Um, five foot eight compared to Scott Duxbury, who's five eleven. So uh, that kind of makes sense. I assume that's the same kind of dichotomy here with Eb Kebby being five foot ten and Bruno Bridges being five eleven. Bruno Bridges has a much better heading ratio than Kebby, despite being virtually the same height. Uh, is he better in the air? Heading of four, jumping reach of twelve, and Kebby's heading is five and a jumping reach of five. Ah. So Kebby can't get off the ground either, uh, weirdly. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. But at the moment, it, it's much of a muchness. I still think that Kebby and Duxbury are the best players in this team. Bruno Bridges is there, maybe. I, I still see potential in Bruno Bridges. There's some categories where he is performing better than Elliot Kebby. Not most of them, but defensively, he does seem to have a bit of that in his game. Um, but maybe he just needs a bit more confidence in himself. So maybe a loan spell next year, bring in someone else to either replace Kebby and try something new or back Kebby up. But uh, on the left, we definitely need someone else backing up Scott Duxbury because Ibu Torre is not cutting it. We need a much better player uh, to back him up. And I think I'll try and ship Torre off as fast as I physically can. His determination is far lower than the others as well. And personality wise, he's just not he's just not fitting in. So that will do for the fullbacks for now. Okay, so centre back analysis. I'm looking forward to this. Three players to kind of pick and choose from. They've all played well over 2,000 minutes this year. Palmer playing the most, but enough for us to definitely see who's played well and who hasn't. And obviously, Enes Makmutovic is on loan, so we are going to have to bring in some more, but I want to see where this kind of lies for us. Um, it's going to be very interesting when we get to other positions, that's for sure. So, passes completed. 
Ashley Palmer's completed the most passes, but it's all fairly close. Uh, passes completed per 90 minutes. Again, it's all fairly close. Team goals per 90 minutes. We can see we score a lot more team goals with Ashley Palmer in the team, like noticeably more. So the Palmer John uh, Cheesy Boys partnership definitely is more fruitful when they're both playing. Mahmutovic, it, it's noticeably lower. Palmer is such a magician from corners. I don't even know why. Like, is he that much taller than Mahmutovic? 6'2", compared to, isn't Palmer 6'3"? No, he's actually 6'1". So is he worth heading? I don't really know. Strength, maybe? 13 for him, and... You know, I, I don't really know why Ashley Palmer is so much better from corners than Mahmutovic when he's heading the ball, but hey... What can we do? Key passes per 90 minutes. Again, it's all about Ashley Palmer. Palmer uh, Cameron John a little bit lower on that one, with Mamutovic definitely being better. But again, Ashley Palmer wins comfortably on that one. Uh, team goals conceded. Why is that zero? Like, what? Uh, okay. Team conceded per 90. Is that because... Uh, I don't know why that's set to zero. Why have they got no clean sheets? I don't understand that. I think that one only applies to goalkeepers now. So that's a little bit stupid. So we'll have to make sure that we uh, flip that around. So yeah, those ones don't count anymore for defenders, which I guess kind of does make sense. So let's move that off and switch this back around again. Right, so there we go. So unfortunately, we can't see these ones because these ones only apply to goalkeepers. Um, but I would like to see how many defend how many clean sheets the defenders got too. But okay. Uh, so team conceded per 90 minutes is kind of what we're more interested in. We conceded more goals than Mahmutovic in the team. Again, showing that perhaps he's not the man we thought he was. Tackles one. Cameron John, definitely lower than the other two. Like, there's a noticeable drop there, particularly on interceptions as well. He's definitely lower. And on headers, one. Um, so it suggests to me that creatively, Ashley Palmer, and defensively, Ashley Palmer is is the king. A um, little bit less on headers and interceptions, but he's, he's right there still. And creatively, he's vastly better. Makhmutovic is not so good for the creative side of things, but he does do the defensive side of things better. Cameron John, definitely more of a creative player, um, but defensively, he does lack somewhat in terms of interceptions and winning headers. So we kind of need to get someone who can do both next year. We need to be someone who's big and strong, but also quite creative and capable of doing stuff from, you know, quite fast. That's what we're going we're gonna to have to look for a new centre-back next season. That, that's my theory on it anyway. Cameron John, I'll happily put keep him as a, a backup, but I think we need a new defensive partner for Ashley Palmer next year. Uh, or maybe two, really. But I'm, I'm so confident that Ashley Palmer could make the step up even more because he just seems to keep performing. Whether he can do it in, the, in uh, League Two, I don't know. But he's he's a bloody good player so what we're looking at here is we're going to lose Mahmoudovic I think we need to sign another first choice center back to partner Ashley Palmer with Cameron John and maybe a young one with high potential again that can start coming in so we've got four on rotation next year uh, so that we've got a real possibility to rotate players when we need to because only having three of them this year has made a real problem at times and I think we didn't win the league because we were missing Ashley Palmer for a couple of those late games and I think Mahmoudovic and John those two as a partnership just did not work like it just didn't unfortunately. Uh, Ashley, you need him in the team, really. No matter who else is in the team, you need him in the team. Right, so moving on to where we're we going to go. Defensive midfielders, I guess. Okay, that one was a little bit easier to sort out. Oh my god, I wish I didn't have the clean sheets on this one. I swear they've changed that. I, I swear that used to display the number of clean sheets the team got. Uh, I don't bloody know. Right, so Paul Turnbull versus Conor DeMeo. I'm expecting this to be DeMeo winning every single category, if I'm honest, uh, because he's just a much better player. But I, I do want to see if there's any areas that maybe he's uh, losing out on. So passing. Conor DeMeo wins, 74% to 71. Not a huge gap, though. Uh, passes completed, it's a similar story. Key pa ah, now key passes per 90 minutes. Turnbull does seem to play a few more. So that is kind of interesting, actually. He has started 14 games this year. I didn't realize it was as many as that. So DeMeo completes more passes, and he plays more passes, but more key passes per 90 minutes for Paul Turnbull. So maybe picking slightly better passes? I don't really know. DeMeo has made a mistake leading to a goal. That much we do know. Um, his tackles one is definitely better, and he's intercepting more. Uh, headers one is definitely less. So that's one area where Turnbull is massively um, winning. As for Ariel per 90 minutes, DeMeo does actually win more of those, but we concede a lot less with him in the team. Uh, not too many things to really dis dissect about this because mostly the job of the DM in this team is to pick the ball up and lay the ball off to one of our slightly more talented players just to make those tackles... Um, which is what he's doing. Tackles and interceptions really are the key thing. He's winning 97, 90% of his, 99% of his tackles and getting more interceptions. Uh, he's playing a reasonable number of key passes per game. It's not noticeably worse, but I would say that having a player there that's a little bit taller, like we talked about with Milan Butterfield last year, 
definitely does make a little bit of a difference in cutting out some of those passes through maybe. Um, so if we were to replace Conor DeMeo at some point, but I'm content that he's going to keep getting better and better if we keep training him in that position. But I might, again, because I didn't want, I didn't do this in the summer, look out for a really good quality DM next year maybe. Someone that's a bit tall, a bit stronger, that can just do a job in screening that back four because we're going to need to be better defensively uh, in League 2 next year. It's undeniable. So yeah, that's pretty much all we can really talk about for these guys. So the plan with this is essentially Paul Turnbull... He's not going to be at the club much longer. Conor De Mayo might have to take a back seat next year to someone else, but it will definitely be needed. There's no denying the fact that he'll be needed. But I do want to have a better player in that position, someone that's big and strong and tall that can do some of the things he can do, but a little bit better in other areas. Mainly, I just want Conor De Mayo with better a bit taller and with better heading stats and strength, really. That's all I really want from that position. Uh, the creativity isn't really that important for that, really, because he's just dropping the ball off to our deep line playmaker and our box-to-box -box midfielder, and that's fine. So we're going to take a look at those guys now. This is where things start to get a little bit more interesting. So, the central midfielder analysis. Now, is, we've got to be a little bit careful here, because these guys have kind of played or across all three roles, um, for the most part. Jack Payne has only ever played as a deep line playmaker, but Magoma and Moody Moo have both operated in essentially both of the other positions, particularly Magoma. So we do need to be careful with that. Goals overall is fine, but goals per 90 minutes, it's Magoma, uh, massively ahead of the other two. Jack Payne has got seven goals this year compared to Moody Moo, uh, but overall, Moody Moo's played a lot less minutes, only 1,700 minutes this season. So his goals per minutes is around about the same as Paris Magoma. So that, that's what I want to see from them both playing that box-to-box -box role. Shows that Moody Moo is right up there with Magoma in that sense and is more than capable of filling in for him if we needed him to. Assists per 90, Moody Moo actually has slightly more assists per 90, but it's really, really close. He's got five assists and five goals this year, nine assists for Paris Magoma, and nine assists for Jack Payne, all relatively close by, which shows to me that they're all performing at a relatively similar level right now. Jack Payne is sort of the weakest of the three, um, considering he's more of an assisting player, and despite that, he's finishing the lowest on that one. He is, of course, the worst player of the three, but that long throw ability is so important. Uh, passing completely I mean, Moody Moo at 82%, he really does control the ball nicely and keeps us in possession a little bit more. We do tend to win more possession, I think, when he's in the game. Payne is definitely not so good at that, considering he's a playmaker, but I guess he's more required to make the, the, the big passes. Chances created per 90 minutes. I mean, it actually is a similar story. Moody Moo is dominating on that one as well. He's creating more chances, creating more assists. Um... I mean, he is flourishing in that box-to-box -box role, frankly. Compared to Magoma in terms of chance created, he's created nine chances in 1,700 minutes when Magoma's only created 11 in more than double that. So there's definitely something to be said for Moody Moo creating opportunities. And it might be because he's more of a box-to-box -box type of player, one that will make those lung-busting runs and lay the ball off to someone for a good chance. We all saw the goal that Danaher and he put together. Things like that, obviously, that was a chance he put away himself. Again, he's better from crosses too. Uh, passes completed per 90 minutes, of course, is going to be higher for Jack Payne because he's the one that they're giving the ball to the most. But key passes per 90 minutes, um, yet again. Oh no, Paris Magoma is the top on this one again, but Moody Moo not far behind. He is definitely matching step with Paris Magoma almost every step of the way here. Uh, and maybe that is because Paris Magoma is more of a Metzala than he is a box-to-box -box midfielder undeniable but I, I can't play him at Salah in this system I just don't think it would work if we played him in that role so we have to not compromise the tactics and maybe we're holding him back a little bit and if someone does come in at the end of the season and, and he wants to leave then I won't have that much hesitation about letting him go provided we get the big clauses the 50% of the next sale clause uh, maybe we even get him loaned back for a year get loads of good add-ons and get a big fee up front so we can invest that money elsewhere and find ourselves a couple more midfielders because we're going to need him next year only having three players in this role again of course De Mayo, uh, has moved into some of these roles occasionally this season too i think i even played turnbull as a box to box one time but that was some desperation more than anything mistake leading to goal we did have one there um moody moo wins more tackles but it's all relatively negligible so interceptions this is kind of interesting to me uh magoma and moody moo once again very very close and jack Payne slightly off the mark but again those two played a slightly different position so we can't read too much into that uh one area that is noticeably better though magoma six headers one uh per game compared to moody moo's four and jack Payne's two so there's definitely an improvement there. I assume Moody Moo is just not as tall as Magoma. So Magoma's six foot tall, uh, six heading and 14 jumping reach, whereas Moody Moo is six foot, is actually six foot one uh, with better jumping reach and better heading. So really Moody Moo should be winning more of those. Uh, so it's interesting that Magoma is doing such a dominating job in the air compared to him. He's actually winning a lot more headers too. That's kind of interesting. We can see less goals with Magoma in the team. We are more defensively sound with him in there and he's won more player of the match awards. But... All in all, Magoma and Moody Moo really are completely interchangeable in places. Moody Moo, I think, this is maybe an option for us. 
against the tougher teams next year, someone like Magoma might be better. He's got a bit more grit, wins a bit more headers, he's better in the air, and he creates a little bit, or he scores a few more goals. So there's that. Um, but so against someone who's maybe a slightly weaker side, Moody Moo might be a better option because he's more creative, can create more chances per 90 minutes, and we might not need his defensive qualities quite so much against a team like that. So maybe that's something we can definitely look at next year. Better sides, Paris Magoma. Games that we were trying to win a bit more, someone like Moody Moo to open the lock a little bit because that seems to be where things have gone for us. But again, we might not have Paris Magoma. I, I definitely do want to look for another central midfielder, particularly if Paris Magoma leaves. Someone that's got young and high potential, but also someone that can maybe slot straight into the first team, a sort of four-star kind of player, like Moody Moo was when he actually joined the club, although that seems to have been adjusted a little bit now. But all in all, I'm very happy with their performances this year. We do need to look for a new deep line playmaker, though, because I do worry about Jack Payne's longevity in this team. His ability to do a job for us in League Two. I mean, I, I don't really know, but that, that long throw is a real asset to this squad and something I don't really want to lose for no reason. Um, so we might want to try and find some other player that can definitely do that. Maybe a new fullback. Maybe look for someone on the right like I'm going to. But someone that's got a decent long throw. It doesn't have to be 16. It just has to be passable, you know? Right, so where are we looking for now? I guess we'll go after the wingers. Okay, so winger analysis. Um, we've basically got four players to look for. Simon Ford played three substitute appearances for a total of like 30 minutes, so I'm not going to count him. Uh, what we're interested in here is Cope versus Anthony, Stevenson versus Banton. I, I really am very, very interested in this particular setup. So goals per 90 minutes. Anthony, of course, had the most on 50, uh, 0.57. Darren Stevenson, of course, dominated his. But Jason Banton, not far behind with 0.47. So Stevenson only just outdoes him in that category. And they are very evenly matched on potential and ability, as are Jake Cope and Jaden Anthony. But you can see how many more goals per 90 minutes Jaden Anthony is scoring over Jake Cope. It, it didn't look obvious at one point, but now it really is very obvious that he's just better in that position. So uh, assists per 90 minutes. Anthony up 0.39. Cope is definitely a much better creative player than he is as a finisher. That is for sure. He's only just behind Anthony on that one. Uh, Darren Stevenson, of course, dominating from the left. Once again, outdoing Jason Banton. So better player in those areas as well. So, so far, it's looking like Stevenson and Anthony are definitely the two men for the job currently. Um, but Jake Cope is a reasonable sort of understudy from a creative standpoint. I just worry about his ability to affect games in terms of scoring goals himself. When he's put through, he does often muff them up. And that's something we really don't want to have from an understudy. Uh, he's good creatively, just not good at the finishing. Banton seems to be a reasonable understudy to Jason, um, to Darren Stevenson. He he's with him in the goals and a little bit further behind on the assists. Chances created uh, is a very similar story, but Banton is actually slightly better at creating chances than Darren Stevenson, but it is very, very negligible at this point. Uh, uh, crosses completed. Here we go. Cross completion. This is kind of an interesting one. So Jake Cope's cross completion is just slightly better than Jaden Anthony, which might explain why he's been able to keep up with him on assists. He's picking out some good balls. Uh, Banton, not too bad either at 14% compared to Darren Stevenson's 12, which would also, I guess, explain uh, why he's uh, why he's created a few more chances, I guess. But Darren Stevenson's chances have led to more goals, undeniably. So he, he's a reasonable understudy. Banton is definitely an option on that left-hand side. He, he's not disappointed me as much as I thought he would looking at these stats. I'm sure there's going to be some areas where he's massively off the pace, but right now he's looking quite reasonably good. Anthony at 61, uh, 71% compared to Jake Cope's 65. There's definitely a big gap there. Uh, well, not a big gap, but a gap that's noticeable. Jaden Anthony is creating more passes too, or certainly, yeah, completing more of them. We'll look at the key passes for that too. When you look at the key passes, it's 0.153 to 1.4. So again, Anthony completes more passes and he gets more key passes per 90 minutes. So he's definitely the much better player of the two. When he's in the team, we score more goals or he creates more goals and scores more goals himself, particularly the scoring part. That is very important. And I think that's what's going to hold Jake Cope back. He's sort of a bring him on when you're already winning and he might create a couple more goals but he's not the you'll play him in and he'll get you 20 goals a season type of player unfortunately as for stevenson and banton they are dead heat here like undeniable their pass completion is identical uh but looking at the chance key passes uh darren stevenson is vastly better so jason banton my guess is his pass completion is the same as um Darren Stevenson but the passes he's making are further back down the pitch so he's playing it into the center of midfield rather than playing it into the strikers for creating chances that that's what I can think of because he's not got the work rate to get up the pitch to make those chances so his pass completion is just all right but he's not making any kind of interesting passes he's just sort of he's the Tom Cleverly he's the sideways pass master potentially of this team shots on target ratio Jason Banton at 69% really does know how to hit the target compared to the others but and, th and that is an important factor. Like, he can put his shot on target. Weirdly, so can Jake Cope at 61%. 
which is so strange. He hits the target, but I guess he's hitting the goalkeeper most of the time. His shots aren't powerful enough. I don't really know. It is noticeable, though, that Banton is probably better as a super sub for that reason, because he can get into positions and get those shots on target if you create the chance for him, but he's not going to fashion one himself, uh, essentially. Dribbling per 90 minutes, I mean, you can see uh, that Banton is the lowest on that one. Um, Stevenson definitely outdoes him there, but Jared and Anthony is a master of dribbling compared to Jake Cope. I assume he has a much better dribbling stat. A dribbling stat of 11 compared to Jake Cope's, who's also 11. I mean, when you look at the difference between those two, is it based on speed, maybe? Is Jared and Anthony a lot faster? I don't think he is. Uh, acceleration of 14 and pace of 13 compared to Jake Cope's 14 and pace of 14. So he's actually faster. But Anthony's just, is he more agile? That might be the difference. Maybe he's more agile. Seven? to 13 uh balance maybe of five compared to jay Anthony's. jay Anthony has the better balance that's the only thing i can think of that's enabling to win that jake cope really should be dribbling a bit more than he is um but there you go. So looking at this at the moment, we've got ourselves a good setup so far with Jaden Anthony on the right and Stevenson on the left. Uh, Banton is a reasonable understudy to Stevenson, as is Jake Cope. But I do think there's room for improvements in these positions. We can definitely look for other players. Um, what I really want, I think, is perhaps an understudy to David Darren Stevenson that's got better work rate so he can get further up the pitch to make some of these passes. That's what I want from that. And on the right-hand side, I want uh, an understudy to Joan Anthony that's got better finishing so that he can at least create a few more goals so that we don't have to rely on Stevenson quite so much. Even if he's only got like six or seven finishing, I don't mind, but anything is better than one. And I think that would make a hell of a difference. I don't even know what finishing Joan Anthony's got. It's probably not that great, is it? It's nine. I'd settle for even a six or a seven in that position, but one is just not going to cut it for us you can see the effect that it's having on the squad um right now strikers and it really is just a comparison of danaher to thompson brissett and i don't think it's going to be a very good one for danaher okay so striker analysis george danaher versus Jaden thompson brissett this should be pretty clear cut for me but i do want to see if there is any advantages to having one or the other in the team I, in my mind danaher is as good as gone from this club but i just want to see if there is any advantages so he's played 1200 minutes which is enough goals per 90 minutes i mean Jaden thompson Brissett has nearly three times the number of goals per 90 minutes. And for a striker, that's quite important. Like, what he's done this year is put the ball in the net. Danaher has two goals this season compared to the 18 that JTB has got. Like, for a striker, that really should be the be-all and end-all. But there you go. As for assists per 90 minutes, it's the same. Now, this is the thing. JTB's one weakness for me, anyway, was his passing um, and vision. So, passing of nine is all right, but vision of five isn't great. Whereas Danica... Danica? Danaher <laughs> has passing of eight uh, and has better vision. But for the most part, they're, they're much of a muchness, the same there. So that to me means that Jaden Thompson Brissett must stay in the team, essentially. Uh, chances created per 90 minutes. There is a bit more chance creation from George Danaher, which I guess does make a little bit of sense. But it's not so much that I, I care, you know? Um, passes completed, slightly more for Danaher. But again, it's not so much that it really matters. Key passes per 90 minutes. Again, Danaher does create more key passes. But... We need a striker that can do both. And I think right now, Jaden thompson Brissett is good, but he is missing some key areas of his game. Like, there are areas... Like, if he had the key pass creation and the chance creation of George Danaher, he would be a vastly better footballer and would have had a lot more assists for us this year, undeniably. Uh, shots on target. Danaher does hit the shots on target more, but he gets less shots on target overall um, per game. Headers won. Only just slightly better there, though, to be fair. And he does dribble a little bit more. But what we need from Jaden thompson Brissett, we need him to be better at picking out passes. He just needs to be a better deep-lying forward, really. Um, and the key things for that, his flair could maybe be a bit higher. In fact, we'll just do a comparison with these two, like with the roles turned on, so we can actually see exactly uh, what we're kind of looking at comparing the two of them. So attributes-wise, they're actually very similar kinds of players, but Jaden thompson Brissett is just better in these areas. In fact, he's better in virtually every area except for the attacking area, which is kind of interesting. Um, so we're going to just highlight the attributes for deep-lying forward. We don't want pressing forward. We want deep-lying forward on support, which is the role we use in this team, and I, I intend to continue using it. So Jaden thompson Brissett is a better finisher. Not by much, to be fair, and his first touch is only negligibly better. Uh, his passing is only slightly better as well, and his technique is actually worse. He's better from penalties and he's better at tackling. Not that those are huge areas that we really need to worry about right now. However, his anticipation is a, a little tiny bit better, and he's much braver, which could definitely help us. He's more determined, and he's got slightly better flair, but his vision is actually worse. He's slightly better balance, 
Um, but he's not as fit. So it's, it's weird to see how bad George Danaher is in comparison. I do wonder if the bravery, determination, um, things like that are having an effect. Because Danaher's a better, much better, got better vision. Um, I really don't know, you know. Maybe it's the fact that Danaher's left only and he's a righty compared to where the balls are coming in from. Uh, he's a tiny little bit taller. But when you compare them, like key passes, he's definitely a better creative player, but only marginally in this sense, but definitely more key passes. But... It doesn't lie. They they haven't scored. The, the amount of goals they've scored are, are simply not there. Both a bit inconsistent. Uh, he lacks vision. He lacks bravery. Uh, what, what are the big strengths? Are there any major issues for them? His speed, his acceleration, his work rate. It is very interesting to see how much better Danaher should be. But there's definitely some reason why he's not playing as well it's undeniable in fact what i look at actually is more like what ben dixon has to say because he is the best in terms of judging but yeah that's kind of interesting for me I, I do think we need to look for a new striker though jaden thompson brissett has done a brilliant job this year but i do think that a striker that can score goals as well as pass a bit better with decent vision uh, a, a proper deep line forward could really change the way that we play next year and could allow us to score a lot more goals from our strikers and score even more goals from our wingers because he'd be able to play them in a little bit better than he has done although he's still done well this year don't get me wrong but he's mostly been there to put them away for himself and once he started doing that he did a bloody good job of it so i think that's kind of where we're at with this at the moment um since we've got to the end of the video uh, i'm going to look around my desk as i often do and the uh, word of the day which you're going to put in the comments if you've got this far in the video is led lamp because i just found a bulb on my desk from a lamp that has broken uh so yeah drop that in the comments if you've got this far obviously let me know your thoughts on any of this stuff i can't put it into action straight away because i'm going to be uh, going off and doing some transfers directly after this but these are always a pleasure to do because just noticing little things like this and some of the other stuff that we've kind of noticed about the positioning of things like uh, jason banton where he might be playing his passes it's not that i'm proving that it's just what i can infer from the stats and I, I think i'm pretty correct on where jason banton's receiving the ball and playing most of his passes that's what logically makes sense in my head uh god i wish we had access to slightly more in-depth uh goals I, I know we could look at his like pass completion over a certain period of time and actually try to prove that but we don't really have time i might have a look at that and come back with that in the next video so if you've enjoyed this episode, I know we're closing in on an hour of my recording, but obviously I would have had to cut some stuff out while I fiddled around uh, with the tactic stuff. Then drop a like on the video to let me know you want me to keep doing these videos because that's always important. And uh, yeah, if you're new to the channel and you watch these, uh, then I guess thank you for that and subscribe. That'd be awesome as well. And I'll join you guys in the next episode for our first game of the season in League Two and all kinds of signings, hopefully, because we've got a decent amount of money to spend. And I intend to probably not spend the whole lot, probably not spend that much of it either. Just get players where we need them, really. That's the key thing here we're not going to overdo it but we are going to definitely be making quite a few signings there's probably going to be quite a few players going out as well i'll see you guys soon thank you so much for watching bye bye